Jonathan and Jessica and myself, we were a bit worn thin, so they were able to get away to Florida. I went down fishing uh, in my special spot and uh, had a great time. And so we do feel uh, much more refreshed and rejuvenated, and uh, we thank you. Uh, we are going to continue to provide online services on Sunday mornings through the summer. Our leadership will be meeting uh, soon to decide if we are going to uh, start in-person worship. Even if we do begin a gathering here at our facility for worship on Sunday mornings with uh, certain safety procedures, we'll continue with uh, online or uh, a live feed so that you uh, who feel more comfortable at home and uh, need to uh, continue to uh, be safe and quarantine yourselves, uh, that you can still participate with us. Yet we know uh, that we long to be together and to stop this uh, sacramental fast that we've been on and to uh, enjoy each other's company in person worshiping the Lord. Um, it could be as soon as July 15th. Don't hold me to that date, but we earnestly desire that we can get together as soon as possible. You can, friends, continue to support the ministries and missionaries of uh, Walnut Creek by online giving, and uh, a link is provided for you. We'll continue our informal gatherings on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. BYOC, bring your own chair. If it's raining, we're canceled. If there's a thunderstorm or there's hail or there's a tornado, we've canceled. Uh, the building will be only open for uh, restroom facility use only. Um, if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, that's fine too, but it was an opportunity for us to gather and see each other continue. Um, we continue to express our gratitude for your patience uh, during this time. It is summer. Things are slowing down. Some of you are finding uh, vacation time, even staycation time. Uh, we want to let you know that we have suspended our, our Zoom devotionals and our Sermon in the Box times. The women's Bible studies continue to meet. Uh, they're slowing down for July and August. The morning group will meet next on Wednesday, July 15th. Also, they will meet twice in August. So those dates will be posted on the Women of Walnut Creek Facebook page. They're still looking at Psalms. The evening group continues to meet. Just uh, go to that website so you know the specific times uh, that uh, they're gathering together. And let's pray uh, for our culture, our country. Uh, let's pray that we will find a way that we can uh, gather again soon as God's people uh, to worship him. I'm going to ask you to join me in the Old Testament book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1. Steve Hilkema gave us a great beginning in this series last week from chapter 3. This week we're going to come back to chapter 1 and I'll read verses 1 to 7 for us. Uh, but before I read our text this morning, I want to invite you to join me in this prayer as we approach God's word together. Open my eyes and I shall see. Incline my heart and I shall desire. Order my steps and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Open my eyes and I shall see, incline my heart and I shall desire order my steps and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Proverbs 1, verses 1 to 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, 
to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning not to despise wisdom and instruction. Help us to hear your word with humble minds and hearts. And we ask for the work of your spirit that he would accompany your word with your power to change us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If I asked you, what is the book of Proverbs about? Even if you don't know a lot about the Bible, my guess is that you would say to me, Proverbs is about wisdom. And you would be right. A plus star student. That's right. Proverbs is about wisdom. And if wisdom is a skill for living life well, I I think that is what wisdom is. It's a skill for living life well. And if it is that, I think most of us want it. Most of us want wisdom. And if we didn't want it three months ago, we certainly want it today. If there is ever a time crying out for wisdom, crying out for wise people, crying out for those who know how to live in righteousness, justice, and equity, it is now. We are in desperate need of wisdom. The problem is that as we come to the book of Proverbs looking for wisdom, we don't find what we would expect. If you bought a self-help book that, that promised to tell you how to live life well, you would expect that that book would have steps five, seven, or 12 steps to a successful life, or, or maybe that book would have bullet points of techniques for living well, or, or at least a flow chart or two. But that's not what we find in Proverbs. Instead, when we open this book, we find poetry. Not the language of rules and techniques, but the language of metaphors and images. And though there is a structure, some structure to this book, there's not much. It is pretty much a collection of poetic sayings that are arranged in a fairly random fashion. So that reading Proverbs is a little bit like dumping out one of those gazillion piece puzzles on your kitchen table. And then beginning to arrange the pieces so that a portrait of a wise life begins to emerge. And that's what we are doing over the next several weeks. We are trying to put together this puzzle. And this morning, we pick up the most important piece of the puzzle. The most important piece object in the portrait. It's found in verse 7. The most essential virtue for a wise life is fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and it's not only the beginning of wisdom, it's the end of wisdom. It's not only in chapter 1, it is also in chapter 31. We don't tend to think of wisdom as a virtue, as something that is, or we don't tend to think of fear as a virtue, excuse me, as something that is good, something desirable. And so we need to ask a couple of questions this morning. First of all, what is the fear of the Lord? And then secondly, why should we fear the Lord? 
And so first of all, what is it? What is the fear of the Lord? And to begin to answer that question, I want to reach outside of the book of Proverbs back to Abraham, founding father of God's people in the Old Testament. And maybe you'll remember that God made expansive promises to Abraham that though he was homeless, he would find a home, a land, that though he was childless, his descendants would be more than the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. The irony is that Abraham didn't live to see those promises fulfilled except one. Late in his life, God gave him a son named Isaac. But after a few years of enjoying this promise gift, God came to Abraham and said to him, I want you to kill your only son. I want you to sacrifice him as an act of worship which is disturbing and shocking. But perhaps what is even more surprising is that without question, without comment, without argument, Abraham packs up, climbs the mountain, builds the altar, puts Isaac on the altar, and raises the knife. Now, we know that God intervenes and stops Abraham from killing his son and provides a ram as a substitute sacrifice for Isaac. And often we stop the story there, but God goes on to say to Abraham, after this experience, now I know that you fear me. That is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is that extraordinary openness to God's word. It is that utter willingness to receive and do what God says. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it contradicts our perceptions and our preferences and our desires. The fear of the Lord is Abraham's most important descendant, Jesus, in the garden on the night before he died, praying, not my will, but yours be done. Walter Moberly, a theologian, said that was, a, that was not a shrug, but an embrace. The fear of the Lord is the sacrificial embrace of his word. Now, if that is the fear of the Lord, what does that have to do with wisdom, with living a wise life? Well, I want you to notice in Proverbs chapter 1, what characterizes those who are wise and those who can become wise. And it is their ears. It is their ability to listen. Verse 5 says that even those who are already wise, it says you wise hear. Verse 7, what is the opposite of the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. They are unable to listen. And learn. The fear of the Lord is the most important piece of the wisdom puzzle because it enables us to have a listening posture towards God, the ultimate source of wisdom. Most of the words of this book are cast as coming from a parent to a child. The idea is that wisdom is born from that kind of relationship 
where an idealized child willingly, eagerly soaks up the knowledge and experience of the parent. The fear of the Lord puts us in that kind of relationship with God himself as a heavenly father whose knowledge and experience is infinitely beyond that of any earthly parent. And it teaches us to stand before him and his word eager to absorb what he has to say. The fear of the Lord reminds us that wisdom is not innate in us. We are not born wise. But then it turns us to what is infinite and available in God. It teaches us to lean in, ready to receive what he has to say, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it hurts. When I was a younger man, I was a pretty decent trumpet player. And one summer during college, I had the opportunity to spend a few weeks with Phil Smith. Uh, Phil Smith, he's retired now, but he was the longtime principal trumpet player for the New York Philharmonic and one of the best ever to pick up the instrument. And so when I was with Phil Smith, I feared him. Not just in the sense of intimidation at his incredible skill level, but also in the sense that I would have done almost anything he told me to do. If he had told me that eating asparagus for breakfast would make me a better trumpet player, I would have at least tried it. I feared And that is just a little bit of what it is to fear the Lord only so much more. Do you come to him and his word with that kind of eagerness? That kind of openness? Do you come to his word Willing to be wrong. Willing to be confronted, corrected. Willing to lose. Or do you come wanting confirmation of what you already think? What you already believe? What you already want? If that is how we approach God and his word, then wisdom will always remain out of reach. But perhaps you remember that scene with Abraham and Isaac. And maybe you think, if that's what the fear of the Lord is, no thank you. If that's what it takes to be wise, maybe I'll just remain a fool. And so, second question, why would we want this? Why should we fear the Lord, have this kind of surrendered openness before him? And to answer that question, I want to once again reach outside of the book of Proverbs back to another founding father of God's Old Testament people, Moses. And maybe you remember Moses, after everything fell apart in his early life in Egypt, he was in the wilderness wandering around the desert with a flock of sheep, and he came across a, across a bush that was on fire. But it was not consumed. It was not burned up. And as if that weren't strange enough, the bush began to talk to him. God spoke to him through the burning bush. And in that conversation, God introduced himself to Moses. 
God told Moses God's own name. He said, I am who I am. Go to my people and tell them I am has sent you. And that name is used throughout the Old Testament of God, usually translated into English as the word LORD in all caps. And so, did you notice in Proverbs 1 verse 7 that it doesn't say to us, fear God. It says to us, fear the Lord. And that name is why we should fear him. Because that name reveals to us his character, his nature. And it reveals to us two important aspects of who he is. It reveals to us that God is both far and near. He is far, not in a physical sense, but in the sense of him being infinitely beyond us. So much more than us and all that he has made. God is not one big piece of the universe. No, he exceeds it all. He is transcendent mystery. He is beyond our grasp, beyond our full understanding, beyond our control. No one, nothing is like him. No one, nothing can compare with him. And so we should fear him. Another Old Testament character named Job learned that fear. Job suffered horrendously, and in his pain, he cried out, and he questioned the fairness and the justice of his suffering. And after he cries out, God meets him, not in a burning bush, but in a tornado. He speaks to him out of the whirlwind, and in some of the most beautiful poetry ever written or spoken, God questions Job with the unanswerable. And in those assaulting questions, God shows, he demonstrates his great infinite beyondness, his so much moreness. His transcendent mystery, his utter difference from Job and us and all that he has made. So that in the end, Job puts his hand on his mouth and is silent before the overwhelming majesty of God. He learned the fear of the Lord. And where Job ends, Proverbs begins. Calls us to join Job with our hands on our mouths. Overwhelmed by the immeasurable greatness of I am who I am. But God's name doesn't stop there. He doesn't only say to Moses, I am who I am. He also says, I am with you. God is not only far, but he is also near. He comes close to rescue those who are his own, to act for their good. That is the story of Exodus. I love the words that we used in our call to worship this morning from Isaiah 56. The one whose name is holy says, I will dwell in the high and holy place far. And also, what a gorgeous conjunction, and I will dwell with the lowly, with the contrite, those who are willing to be wrong, to revive the spirit 
of the lowly and the heart of the contrite. We should fear the Lord not only because he is powerful, but because he is loving. Not only because he is holy, but because he is merciful. Psalm 130 verse 4 says of God, with you there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. We learn to fear him not only in his infinite majesty, but also in his immeasurable kindness. And those who fear the Lord are not just those who are intellectually sophisticated, certainly not those who are morally perfect. It is those who are broken and forgiven. Wisdom starts not with rigorous logic or good common sense. No, wisdom starts starts with wonder. Wonder at the one whose name soars and reassures all at the same time. That's why we should fear the Lord, because that is who he is. Viktor Frankl was a survivor of multiple Nazi concentration camps, and he went on to become one of the great psychiatrists of the the 20th century, writing about how we can find meaning in life. And he said this about living a meaningful and wise life. He said, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment instead. That is what Proverbs says to us. It says, if you want to be wise, you have to realize that the heart of wisdom isn't cleverness that helps you live life successfully. No, the heart of wisdom is bewilderment. Bewilderment at the God who reveals himself not just in the burning wood of a bush in the desert, but more fully in the blood-soaked wood of the cross of Jesus. You see, Jesus isn't just the ultimate example of the fear of the Lord. He is the Lord who became the sacrifice for us, the sacrifice for our sin, the sacrifice for our foolishness. And in him, we find not only that God is beyond our grasp, but we find even more importantly that we are not beyond his. We are not beyond his grasp. He comes near to redeem us, to make us his own. And it is when we are in awe who Jesus is and what he has done. That is when we'll learn to fear the Lord. And that is when we will be ready to listen to him. So what will capture your awe this week? What will capture your fascination? What will capture your fear. There are so many options. There's so much for us to think about. There's so much for us to worry about. There's so much for us to listen to, to read, to watch. There's so much information coming at us, too much information to process. But what is most essential for us, if we want to grow in wisdom, is that before all of that, we will be struck silent. 
before the astonishing 